Okay, so we're going to get started now. Uh, Paul has introduced me, I think. <laughs> no. So I, I have given the talk the title, Joseph Frank, The Untimeliness of Intelligence. Joseph Frank became famous twice within literary studies more than 30 years apart, first in 1945 and then in 1976. Joseph Frank was born a century ago, 1918, and died just recently, 2013. Thinking about his life and his life's work, feeds reflection on what might may be possible for humane inquiry, what critics and scholars can do to achieve something of value. Each of the two projects that won him fame arose from a consuming and extended personal intellectual obsession. The first project, Spatial Form in Modern Literature, is a long essay that sprang from nearly a decade's passion. And the second project, titled simply Dostoevsky, produced a series of five books that from beginning to end took nearly 50 years. Both projects stand apart from the critical projects we think of as defining the moments in which they appeared. In the earlier 20th century age of close reading, when the most brilliant emergent work focused on analyzing the language of particular poems, think of now classic work by William Empson and R.P. Blackmer, Frank instead considered the large body of what was not yet called modernism, nor did he call it modernism, drawing from art history he proposed a new way of thinking about form as the defining character of the modernist period and movement. Long ago, I read essays by René Wellick on period concepts in comparative literature, and it's actually astonishing that he doesn't cite Frank in, in that context of his work, <coughs> despite, I should mention, being a blurber on several of the uh, Frank Dostoevsky volumes. Very, anyway, that, address, Frank now in that classic essay, ad addressing the wasteland, Ulysses, à la recherche du temps perdu, and much else, Frank argued that modern writers strove to overcome the linear consecutiveness of language and also language's reference to the world. Modern techniques of composition, he argued, replaced external reference with internal reference from one part of the work to another, creating patterns that define the work's wholeness. In his famous slogan, modern literature could not be read, but only reread. And actually, uh, Nazim's lines, uh, you know, Nergis already was talking about something a lot like this uh, this morning. Frank's spatial form in modern literature appeared in three successive issues of the little magazine, Suwannee Review, edited by Alan Tate in 1945, when its author, Frank, was in his 20s, possessed no academic position, no academic degree, true also of the older critics, Kenneth Burke and R.P. Blackmer, both later close friends of Frank's. And Frank was employed as a journalist. He worked in Washington for the Bureau of National Affairs, now owned by Bloomberg, which Wikipedia describes as a source of legal tax, regulatory, and business information for professionals. I can't help mentioning that at the very same time Frank was doing that in Washington, my father in New York, possessing a law degree but no practice, worked for Commerce Clearinghouse, now owned by Walters Kluver, which provides information for tax accounting and audit workers. <laughs> the spatial form essay got great uptake. 
By 1948, it was enshrined in the textbook Criticism, the Foundations of Modern Literary Judgment, and it became a landmark. 20 years later, Frank Kermode reanimated the essay by criticizing spatial ideas severely in his great The Sense of an Ending. Kermode found spatial form a totalitarian notion. And the topic was further debated by Frank, Kermode, and others in early issues of Critical Inquiry, 1977-78. You could have thought at that moment that Frank was a precursor of the 70s theory movement and would play a major part in these set of exchanges going on then, from which Boundary 2 itself arose, I think particularly of Bill Spanos's 1970 essay just before the Boundary 2 project began, the essay titled Modern Literary Criticism and the Sp Spatialization of Time, an Existential Critique. Now, Frank was indeed involved in France with the, with the founders of the journal Poétique, when it began in 1970, Poitique had the élan and the openness of the then new new literary history. And it published Frank's spatial form essay in French just a few issues after publishing Demand's Rhetoric of Blindness and Derrida's White Mythology. But intellectually, Frank's heart had long gone elsewhere. This renewed afterlife for spatial form, and particularly his own engagement with the debates around it, coincided with his second major accomplishment. It seems to me that what might have made it possible, even have led him to re-engage his past, may have been triumphant relief. Finally, in 1976, so the book was in press just as he was starting to write for critical inquiry in several new essays engaging spatial form and its critics. Finally, in 1976, after some 20 years' work, Princeton University Press published the first volume of Frank's extraordinary critical study of Dostoevsky. That's that. Dostoevsky project eventually concluded in 2002 at five volumes, some 2,400 pages, and more major prizes than I'm aware of any other author in our game is winning. Let me just rehearse a little bit how the book laid out, five books laid out, and their honors in the world. The first volume, subtitled The Seeds of Revolt, 1821 to 1849, takes Dostoevsky through his early success with the novel Poor People, and then his arrest and mock execution. That volume was the first work ever to win in this this, both the MLA James Russell Lowell Prize and the Phi Beta Kappa Christian Gauss Award for Criticism. <coughs> Eric Sundquist's To Wake the Nations in 1993 is the only other one. In 1984, Frank's second volume, subtitled The Years of Ordeal, 1850-59, which covers Dostoevsky's decade in Siberian exile and reinterprets his experience in the penal colony, won the Biography Award from the National Book Critics Circle. In 1986, the third volume won a second MLA Lowell Prize. That volume is subtitled The Stir of Liberation, 1860-65. It defines the stupendous energy of Dostoevsky's return to the literary world, climaxing with notes from underground. And I just mentioned that in the project as a whole, notes from underground comes just right about it. In 1995, the fourth volume, subtitled The Miraculous Years, 1865-1871, 
won a second Phi Beta Kappa Gauss Award for its analysis of crime and punishment, the idiot, and the devils. You've got to say, all that happened from 1865 to 1871. I mean, yeah, that's, those are miraculous years. I mean, you could find a moment in Henry James that looks almost like that. Um, Finally, at age 90, Frank was recognized for his lifetime achievement by the American Association for the Advancement of Slavic Studies. I'll say this again in a little while, but I'd better say it now, too. He had no training as a Slavicist. And finally, the 950-page single-volume abridgment, Dostoevsky, a writer in his time, Now, how had the brilliant young writer of the spatial form essay on Western modernism become the profoundly scholarly critic of the Russian 19th century novelist? That early essay had opened publication opportunities and combined with the support of Alan Tate, won him a Fulbright, a Fulbright to Paris around 1950. I haven't been able, because Fulbright website won't let you know. I haven't been able to figure out sources differ. It was either 48 to 50 or 50 to 52. He married Marguerite Strauss, a French mathematician, and for the rest of his life had a second home base in Paris. As a rising star, he presented a series of Gauss seminars in criticism at Princeton in 1955. Inspired by his time in Paris, he offered existential themes in modern literature. Everyone back in the 50s knew if you were doing existential themes, you began with notes from underground. And so he did. And it, of course, had a big impact on Sartre and Camus as part of what he brought from France. Uh, in but as he worked on this complex text, he found he could not agree with the prevailing ways of understanding it. He could no longer agree that notes from underground affirmed self-tormented alienation as the necessary condition of modern life. <coughs> but what then did it do? And that's where the next 50 years got started. The spatial form essay had had its beginning. Frank writes this in one of the later reflections. About so the story, as he tells it, of that essay had its beginning when Frank, as an orphaned teenager, read Juna Barnes's Nightwood soon after its publication. He wanted to figure out why that novel struck him as so different from ordinary fiction, even though it wasn't as obviously experimental as works by Joyce or Wolf or Faulkner. And bit by bit, over the next eight years, he put the pieces together and uh, came out where he came out. Notes from Underground is even less obviously difficult than Nightmare. Yet as Frank tried to figure out this short novel, he felt that he needed to understand Dostoevsky in his time. And of course, that, that's the title of the, the final reprise of the five-volume project, A Writer in His Time. But he found the sources available in Western languages inadequate. And he realized he hadn't learned Russian. Frank accomplished these two goals sufficiently, that is, figuring out notes from underground and learning Russian, to earn a PhD in 1960 from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago with a 400-page typescript on Dostoevsky and Russian nihilism, a context for notes from underground. He condensed the core argument into an essay, Nihilism and Notes from Underground, which in 1961 appeared as a long lead piece in Suwani Review. Finally, he figured it out, a work of self-critique, which polemically satirized intellectual views that people like Dostoevsky himself had held. And then, in a further act of criticism, showed the damage to life caused by current radical viewpoints. This 1961 essay did a lot. 
It transformed a dazzling and enigmatic masterpiece of 19th century fiction by showing for the first time its precise relations to long forgotten political writings of its age. That's an abstract characterization which I've offered so that I can then name another work almost contemporary with Frank's that does kind of the same thing. Namely, the 1963 American quarterly piece by Alan Heimert, Political Symbolism in Moby Dick. At least in my life, you know, Moby Dick never looks the same after you've encountered the materials of, uh, of that essay. And that's, that's what I think happens with Notes from Underground, too. So a word on Alan Heimer, born 1928, died 1999. Heimer was the prized student of America's most important intellectual historian of his era, Perry Miller, who lived from 1905 to 1963. Miller's work on Puritanism shaped American studies for over 40 years. Heimert's stupendous Melville essay seems in retrospect a happy accident in a career that never recovered from early failure. Failure, of course, is always relative. Uh, Heimert gained tenure at Harvard. He was a charismatic teacher, longtime master of Eliot House, but he never wrote another book after his first book dropped Stillborn from the Press. Despite its title that offered to follow up and enlarge Miller's two volumes on the New England mind. Heimert's Religion and the American Mind from the Great Awakening to the Revolution, 1966, is now highly valued historiographically although Harvard University Press no longer carries it, instead an Oregon religious publisher. Frank, for 30 years after Spatial Form, published a good deal in little magazines, but just a single book of essays, The Widening Geyer, Crisis and Mastery in Modern Literature, 1963, with a 1968 paperback, which was very, I got a copy. A volume introduced by Alan Tate, reviewed admiringly by Paul Demont, and worth comparing as a, a, a volume and as an event with blindness and insight. After a few years teaching at University of Minnesota, where Alan Tate's word meant a lot, uh, Frank came to Rutgers, where for some years he had the office next to Ralph Ellison whose Invisible Man, 1952, took its start from Notes from Underground just about when Frank began his decisive encounter. So at this point in Frank's career, namely, there he is beside Ralph Ellison on the Rutgers campus, at least some who knew and admired him found it a letdown from his spectacular start, his hard-won erudition, and his impressive power of mind. The sociologist Daniel Bell, born 1919, also lived a long time, died just in 2011. Bell, just a year younger than Frank, also from New York Jewish immigrant beginnings, also like Frank, long an economic journalist, also achieved his PhD the same year Frank did, presenting Bell did his first book, The End of Ideology, to Columbia for the degree Extra Muros at the same period he joined their faculty. Bell knew Frank from the University of Chicago in the 1950s. They might have known each other in New York, but I, I, don't, I know they knew each other from UC. Uh, and I met Bell when Harvard recruited him in 1969 was his career peak. He was completing both The Coming of Post-Industrial Society, published in 73, and The Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism, published in 76. Bell and I were both affiliated with Leverett House. He a famous professor, I a candidate for the PhD. Joseph Frank's name came up, 
And I learned what a mistake Bell thought Frank had made, spending all that time learning Russian at the cost of how much else he might have done. And here it was 15 years later. And <laughs> Bell's judgment startled me. I had studied Dostoevsky with Frank at Harvard just a few years earlier, and I had great hopes for Frank's planned book. It was going to be a book. <laughs> uh, Daniel Bell was personally kind and academically generous to me. I could have been a protege. But in auditing Bell's graduate seminar on culture and social structure, I read pretty much all of Gerald Lukacs, then available in English, and found that I thoroughly disagreed with Bell's view of Lukacs' career. I realized, by the way, I never did ask Joe Frank, so what do you think about this? <laughs> uh, contra Bell's view of the brilliant early Lukács degenerating into a party hack, what else could you be if you had survived the purges? I found that Lukács' praise for Solzhenitsyn's early anti-Stalinist works argued from exactly the premises Lukács had established in the 1930s, for example, in the historical novel, and continued through the 1950s, as in the essays praising Thomas Mann and criticizing the ideology of modernism. It's not that Bell, therefore, had no use for me. Rather, with a young person's decisiveness, I judged I had no more to learn from him. Instead, I followed the path of Frank and Heimer. That is to say, uh, I do, in thinking of myself as somebody concerned with important novels of the 19th century, particularly <coughs> in intimate relation to the overall life of their times, these are two of the three exemplars from my first studies who have been crucial. As a first year undergraduate in Introduction to American Literature, Fall 1963, I attended Alan Heimert's unforgettable extra lecture, Saturday morning, where he orally previewed the forthcoming American Quarterly article on Moby Dick. Then in spring 1966, I took Frank's Dostoevsky lecture course. Backstory to Harvard. After the tragic death of Renato Pajoli, in, in a California car crash, Harvard needed a senior comparatist with strength in Russian. Despite lacking formal credentials as a Slavicist, Joe Frank taught at Harvard for a semester, spring 66, as visiting professor of comparative literature. He offered a lecture course on Dostoevsky, all in English, unless you were a Russian major or graduate student, in which case you had other responsibilities and a graduate seminar on issues in contemporary criticism, a topic not otherwise represented in the curriculum. Somehow I knew that I should take the Dostoevsky course. Even though up to that point I had believed, with that young person's decisiveness, that I should only study literature that I could read in the original. <clears throat> Never looked back. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna skip a little bit. If you want to know some, ask me something about the history of literary criticism course in the question period, you can do that. <coughs> Not uh, the issues in contemporary criticism. Okay. Uh, let me conclude the personal narrative. Um, my first years as a faculty member were deeply shaped and enriched by the opportunities Joe Frank provided and by his supportive friendship. At Princeton, as a beginning assistant professor of English, fall 1973, I found in my mailbox an invitation to the Gauss Seminars in Criticism, a flourishing institution founded in the late 1940s, meeting Thursday evenings, which proved by far the most animating feature of the established university. I received that invitation only by formal happenstance. That is, as a member of the English department, I was invited to the seminars because the first set of seminars was given by the figure 
of interest to people in English, Alan Tate. Uh, but receiving the invitation, I discovered the director of the seminars was Joseph Frank. After the premature death of R.P. Blackmer in 1965, Frank, who was Blackmer's literary executor, was recruited from Rutgers to Princeton and succeeded Blackmer as director of the Gauss seminars. Blackmer's career, by the way, was haunted by over 30 years' struggle to achieve a book worthy of its subject, Henry Adams, resulting in several great essays and a posthumously edited book in fragments. Frank, who dedicated his fourth volume to the memory of Richard, in this respect, far outdid him. And the, the little accountant in my head actually sees that it was precisely the decades of life more than Blackmer had that allowed Frank to do that. I attended the series because I wished to reintroduce myself to Professor Frank. I had become a critic and scholar of the novel in good part, inspired by the example of his course. By the way, I never did ask anybody or Joe or anybody, I never found out if Harvard turned him down or he turned Harvard down. But in any case, my actual dissertation director, Harry Levin, whose important writings on literature and society also did inspire me, Levin himself never offered a course so directly influential. Even more important, I can see now the breadth of Joe's interests, the capacity to maintain a sense of ongoing conversation with the seminar guest over four to six weeks and with the self-selected community of Gauss regulars over months and years. That helped prepare me for my own work, not only as a writer, but also as a member of Boundary 2, as well as as a humanities center director give some feel for those times to remember when Carol Kay and I in Paris in summer 1977 made a call on Joe and Marguerite. Besides reporting what their French friends were saying about the new American president, Jimmy Carter, my chance to learn French for a peanut, Joe also <laughs> held up several copies of a new journal Acte de la Recherche en Sciences Sociales, and he told me why I should read work by the journal's founding editor, Pierre Bourdieu. I've presented all that is astonishing and wonderful about this particular untimeliness. Uh, Joe Frank's profound self-direction, which led him to argue for period style in the era of new criticism and devote himself to intellectual biography amidst the theory room. In the idiom so crucial to Edward Said's thinking about human possibilities, Joseph Frank displays a triumph of effort. It's hugely imp important to remain alive to such possibilities, including even the chance that such effort may be rewarded as his eventually was. It's remarkable that so far as I can tell, the fall of the USSR, which hugely changed the character of scholarly exchange between American and Russian scholars, which also opened archival access never before known, seems to have made no difference to the course of the unfolding analysis. That is, he acknowledges the capacity to make use of new materials and so forth. But I don't have verbatim memory or even detailed notes from the 1966 course, but as a whole, the interpretation was already all there. It really seems like the vision was completed near the start, leaving the decades-long task of spelling it out and finding the right quotations by which to illuminate it. And here we're on the shadow side of, of untimely. Even as Frank shows Dostoevsky's works rooted in all the intense controversies of Russian history, both growing from and differing from German and French and English writers and thinkers too, Dostoevsky's works in 
the five volumes as a whole feel like they're breaking free from their time and becoming, in a Yeatsian phrase you all know, monuments of magnificence. Among their innumerable accomplishments, perhaps the five volumes also subdue the power to shock that Dostoevsky still possesses for those who read him. As I find, for example, when I start to read Crime and Punishment, it, allowed to one or another auditor, and it's just, it's just so amazing. Uh, that power, still so challenging, fueled Dostoevsky's work's impacts on Friedrich Nietzsche, André Gide, Marcel Proust, Thomas Mann, Virginia Woolf, D. H. Lawrence, John Paul Sartre, Richard Wright, Albert Camus, Ralph Ellison, I mean, more recently or on Pamuk, but, uh, I fear that Frank's Dostoevsky monumentalizes the modernist Dostoevsky without all the turbulence, to use a black word, that, that Dostoevsky inflicted on those writers. We'd never have cared enough to make us want the amazing story that Frank so painstakingly composed at such length in pages and time. Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering, because you mentioned the sense of an ending, does yeah. Kermode engage with the spatial form essay in the romantic image? Because um, it would seem a place to do so. Yeah, I don't remember that he does so. Joe Frank, in his response to Kermode, rehearses Kermode's career, including his, his Frank's thoughts on the, the relevance of romantic image to what he was doing, what Frank was doing in spatial form. But I don't think that uh, that romantic image does. Where does Frank respond to Kermode? Is that in the widening fire? Uh, no. Uh, in, so in, uh, in several issues of volume four of Critical Inquiry, there, there, you know, so Kermode had, had addressed Frank critically in the sense of an ending in 67. And 10 years later, there's there are other scholars uh, of less consequence who had begun to do scholarly work on the spatial form essay as uh, both something that might have theoretical resonance going forward now in the age of emergent narratology, uh, but that also, you know, anyway, so there are those people, but then, so critical inquiry asked Frank, would you, would you write us something about spatial form at this point? And, and he wrote his, reflections on spatial form in which he engaged with Kermode's criticism. Kermode replied, Frank further replied, there's, uh, there's a volume of, that came out as late as 1991 that collects Frank's essays around the topic of spatial form. And there's another volume uh, that came out some years earlier that, that encapsulates spatial form as topic and controversy. So there, there's there's stuff there, but, um, and, and actually, um, you know, in another essay that I have written, I, I counterpoint Kermode and Frank as two people who both did astonishing work after the age of 65. Uh, it's a, an essay called, What Does a Professor Do When He Retires? <laughs> uh, you know, because Ker Kermode, in effect, leaving Cambridge, and not too long after that, the Academy by the mid 80s, you know, contributed then hundreds of essays to the London Review of Books, which he had helped found a few years earlier. And Frank, on the other hand, retired from Princeton to Stanford, where he completed three more volumes of, of the bio, bio, uh, biocritical study. Is that a hand up, Joe? No. Oh. Yes, Doc. Yeah, it was really elegantly written and wonderfully <coughs> felt. Uh, you use a phrase, the, the shadow of, um, of The shadow of untimeliness, or the shadow side of untimeliness yeah. is what I said. And I, I had um, the feeling that uh, the, the deferral of writing this essay about Frank 
was what kept you in a, in a certain relation to uh, that shadow side mm -hmm. of autonomous as, as a kind of resource. And I, I'm wondering, uh, that is as a kind of uh, uh, writerly resource, what does it feel like, um, this is an affective question, yeah, yeah. to have um, written what uh, for you was uh, at once a, a, um, a commissioned task, Self-commission. Right. We, well, well, we 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 owe B two Pink. Yeah. yeah. Oh. It's the review of the big book. Anyway, yes, go ahead. But I mean, don't mean commissioned in terms of conscripted, but in terms of your first book. Yes. What you mean by commissioned spirit? Yes. And um, at, at the same time, a, a kind of labor of, of love. Yeah. What does it mean to uh, to you to complete that? Is it a, is it a is it a working through? Is it a letting go? Is it a how would how would you describe? Yeah. It? Well, uh, first of, first of all, uh, Don knows, and I will fill in a tiny bit more that that this has been around with me for a while. That is to say, once it became clear what the uh, scope and accomplishment of the whole project was, it seemed to me that aside from all of the adulatory reviews that it was getting as each volume appeared, it, it was important to try to make sense of, of, the, whole, of the whole thing. So it's been, it's been at least articulated as something I thought I wanted to do slash should do uh, on the scale of 15 years. And I actually had a con, you know, the last time I saw uh, Joe and Gigi was in Stanford when something else brought me there in 2004, I think it was. And even that's a lot. And, you know, I reprimand myself for not having just done an interview with him. Uh, because you, know, you, just then, you, know, you do it afterwards and you discover, who can even tell when he had the Fulbright? I mean, I believe I could probably mm -hmm. find that out from within the family. But, uh, but uh, so there, there's, there's the problem of the deferral. But also, uh, it actually takes a long time to try to make my sense uh, out of what the accomplishment, extraordinary as it is, of the five volumes should, you know, should be understood as. And I, I, haven't, I haven't fully uh, reached, uh, reached my judgment on that. So to answer part of your question, it's, you know, it's not accomplished yet. <laughs> Not just that this is the talk version of what will be an essay, but I mean, it, at this point, it is all there is. It's not that I have the long essay and I've cut this down. I, I, I've written it for this presentation and will revise it for the, the full essay. I mean, there, you know, there are so many different questions live to me to raise. As part of the research only done at this point, but also actually making use of a bio resource that only seems to have appeared within the last few years, a, a Stanford colleague, a roughly an age mate, uh, a little younger, uh, of, of Joe's, who, who had done uh, a, an extensive oral history uh, interview with him and drew my attention to an earlier essay than the spatial form essay, which is obviously an extremely important essay. Uh, and so I, I need to read and, and come to terms with that. I need, I need to, and any advice you all offer me would be great, but you noticed that the name Alan Tate appears five times without any further characterization. There are some people who will read this will say, who in God's name is Alan Tate? There are others who will say, what was somebody that you apparently respect doing with that reactionary dog? Uh, and, you know, and, and, and everywhere in between. Uh, so I, I need to figure that out. Uh, but when I, when I listen, um, to, to, you, you're also producing a, a, a genre of writing that is um, anomalous to what I 
um, understand to be a, 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 a genre of writing that I associate with Jonathan Aaron. That is, you, you have intertwined your own um, career mm -hmm. in a kind of complex fate relation with, um, uh, with Blackmer, with Frank, with Heinert. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a wonderful, um, I think, wonderfully crafted essay. And uh, I'm, I'm curious about um, the, the intentionality, the, 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 what it was that, uh, for you, motivated that um, yeah, well, diagonal. I'd, yes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm still working on the form, not just the, the specifics of this essay, but also that generic form that, uh, that you characterized uh, preliminarily. And uh, as you... As, as you know, an essay that I wrote a few years ago for the Boundary to Bill Spanos uh, celebration issue has something of that form. Uh, and a piece that I wrote for New Literary History to celebrate Ralph Cohen's last, having completed 40 years as founding editor of that journal, has something of that form. Um, and. There's at least one other that I'm not thinking of at the moment. But um, I, I, have, I haven't yet done that essay about Edward Said, mm -hmm. whose teaching fellow I was in the summer of 1968. Um, so I have uh, written more about Edward, but I've not written about, about it in that way. But this is the one where I actually <laughs> As, as you, where I, I actually tried to uh, to compose a time shift. <laughs> you know, it, it was in that sense uh, on its small scale, uh, you know, the most the most pressuring the form. And, you know, we'll, we'll see how it works. Yes, Ron. And then and then notice. Yeah. Uh, that will have to be Oh, all right. Well, okay. after that. Well, ask and ask, and I'll see what I can ask. <laughs> um, I'm not smack. Yes, sir. It's beautiful. Thank you. And historical. Mm -hmm. And uh, an exhibition of an important intellectual biography that was quite timely in its untimeliness. You, you demonstrate in the style of your presentation, as well as in the thematics, the importance of taking time. And the way you lay out Frank's career and the fruits that come from slow thinking was an exhibition of critical work. Not the critical work, but Yes, the, sh the, the, the shadow side of a time of intellectual work threw me. Mm -hmm. Because it seemed to be saying something quite contradictory. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sort of following up on Don by asking you, pressing, yeah. please say a bit more about that contradiction. Yeah, well, there's, there's an as yet unresolved, and perhaps by definition they always are, ambivalent. That is to say, uh, there's so much to admire, as I've tried to say. There's so much to learn from what he has done, and so much to be grateful to in what one learns. And two, besides the specifics, there are you know, the, the values of exemplarity in many ways. On, on the other hand, it, it, is, it is the case that by, by his own account, which is not elaborate, but still one feels one can trust one's impression, no. something about notes from underground you know, just got under his skin, and he, he had to figure it out. And it seems that in figuring it out, he offered the possibility, at least, uh, of 
Dostoevsky is not getting under anybody else's skin in quite the same way. Uh, now, that will never really happen. That is, anybody who reads Dostoevsky will still have the possibility of being shocked, startled, and driven to their own path of discovery. And, and yet, it was his choice to, to you know, what do you want to say? I'll use schematics that aren't uh, at all adequate to the case, but, but to present Dostoevsky in a classic mode rather, rather, rather than an ecstatic mode. Mm -hmm. And Slana and Ron have already asked all the great, beautiful questions and articulated all the um, <coughs> key issues, but um, mine is very sort of um, detail-based. What was his relationship with the Slavic department? I mean, how was oh, he received the oh, Slavic well, I mean, um, sir, I, I don't know the whole story, okay. but first of all, he did, mm -hmm. of course, receive their Lifetime Achievement Award. Right. Uh, second of all, he was already at Princeton mm -hmm. uh, in in the you know in the Slavic as well as comparative literature department. He was he was you know he 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 raised junior Slavicists who have become important professors. Uh, he, I think, my impression is he was embraced as an eager learner. Uh, even in the worst case, somebody willing to do something too hard that for us to have even imagined doing it. Uh, yeah, but that's of course uh, an important question. I mean, the politics of Slavic <laughs> talk more to it are just so complicated, mm -hmm. especially during that period. Um, to that, um, you know, it's wonderful to. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and just to say one more thing from when you evoke in that period, there's still a further figuring out for myself the overall politics of, of his, you know. There's certainly, certainly he, he is not on the side of, of pure evil, whether that of various forms of Russia or various forms of the United States. But absent that, where do we put him? I haven't figured it out. Right, thank you.